Hey class, welcome back to World History 2. I hope you're all doing well today. Last time we finished up the look at the French Revolution and set the stage for our video today. And our video today will be looking at the life and the rule and some of the battles and campaigns of Napoleon. Stay tuned for the Okay, we're going to have the PowerPoint lecture on revolutions part five, and this will be the, the PowerPoint on uh, Napoleon. So there's a picture of him, Napoleon Bonaparte, again, his uh, famous stance with his hand in his waistcoat. Overview. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte became emperor of France, and his exploits would impact Europe uh, forever. He was a shrewd and ambitious man. Napoleon Bonaparte was a skilled military strategist, and he w waged war all over Europe, resulting in a massive expansion of the French Empire. However, the disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812 resulted in Napoleon abdicating the throne. That means he, he had to leave the throne, gave up the throne. He abdicating, abdicating the throne and living in exile for two years. 1815, he briefly returned to power but was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, after which he was exiled until his death. Okay, like the other um, PowerPoints we had with the Revolutionary War and um, we looked at a timeline, so it's kind of the same thing we're going to do with Napoleon. Again, you don't need to know these dates unless I specifically tell you to know a certain date. But just to give you an idea of the time period you're in and how time has gone by in his life, 1769, he's born on the island of Corsica. And as a boy, he is sent to school in France and then to a military academy where he showed his skill as a student. In 1785, he graduated as an artillery officer. In 1795, he worked with Robespierre and quelled uprisings by the counter-revolutionists. 1797, he captured Austrian territory and became a national hero because he went in and took some Austrian territory, gave it to France. So that's pretty good for him, and he became a hero. 1798, uh, he, he hates England. And he decides to invade Egypt, which was controlled by England. Uh, England had a lot of influence on uh, Egypt and Palestine and the Middle East. A lot of influence there uh, for during this time and also for many years to come. Uh, so he decides to invade Egypt, but he's defeated uh, in Egypt. Here's Napoleon uh, before the Sphinx. Battle of the Three Pyramids. So you can see them back there in the back. 1798, while away, uh, France lost several European battles, and Napoleon returns claiming a great victory in Egypt, and he's welcomed as a hero. Remember, he didn't win in Egypt, but he comes back and says he won, and he's welcomed as a hero. So he's getting territory from Austria. He comes back and says he beat the British in, in Egypt, and so now he's a hero, so he's becoming kind of popular. 1799, as part of the consulate, Napoleon engineered a political coup resulting in his increase in power and popularity and ambition. So it all kind of went to his head, and he wants more power. He's very popular. He has high ambitions. And he becomes the first consul of the republic. 1803, he sells Louisiana to the United States. And you may have heard of that. It's called the Louisiana Purchase. And the reason he needed to sell this was because he was in, in, in a war in Haiti, the island of Haiti, and that's the Haitian Revolution. We're not going to talk about that, but um, he's in a war in Haiti because they're revolting. And so he sells Louisiana to the United States, and it's a massive amount of land. And the selling price is three cents per acre. And so here's a map of the Louisiana Purchase. So you see it almost doubles the size of the United States then. Right here on the map with the cursor, you can see the Mississippi River. So all of this was owned by France, and he sells it to the United States. So now the United States is all of this, and more exploration can take place out into the West. 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, becomes emperor of France. He basically crowns himself, not literally putting the crown on his own head, but he has himself crowned emperor of France. In 1805, he attacks the British naval fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar, and that's off the tip of Spain. But Napoleon loses this battle, and the British, 
And they're already known for their Navy. Well, their seafaring prestige is bolstered even further because not only years ago did they defeat the Spanish Armada and become the naval power, well, now you have Napoleon who's, who's rising in, in power in France, and they defeat his navy too at the Battle of Trafalgar. So British uh, prestige is, is on the rise. 1805 to 1812, Napoleon is victorious in numerous battles across Europe, and he begins to really get this powerful grip on Europe because he's going around Europe and winning these battles and taking territory and he's doing this for a good number of years 1805 to 1812 and then in 1812 he decides to invade Russia and this is uh, this is not very good for him because even though there's some success at first uh, he, he does struggle and he ends up losing he invades Russia he loses and he's chased back to Paris and the invasion of Russia, we're going to talk about that. That's coming up in the slides here in a few minutes. So here's a picture of the Battle of Trafalgar. Here's Napoleon's coronation. So here he is down here, and the crown is about to be put on him. So here's the Catholic Church guy right here, like mediating it. Russian campaign. In 1812, Napoleon invades Russia with his grand army. He has 600,000 soldiers with 50,000 horses. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to bring in his soldiers and horses, and he planned for this big engagement where he's going to battle the Russians in one major battle, and he's going to try to do this within 20 days of his invasion of Russia. He's going to defeat them. He's going to claim this vast territory for his empire, and, and he's just going to be this great emperor controlling this vast empire in Europe and now Russia. In case things move a little too slow, he ends up bringing food for 30 days. Unfortunately for him, he should have brought a lot more food. The Russians used a scorched earth retreating strategy. And what that means is as Napoleon is advancing, the Russians are not battling him. They're not, they're not standing to fight. Instead, they're retreating. And as they retreat, they destroy all of the crops and all of the supplies and the bridges and all the different things that they have that uh, could go to help France, the Napoleon's army. They destroy all of that, and they continue to retreat deeper and deeper into Russia. They do this so that Napoleon cannot use them and to draw, to draw Napoleon deeper into Russia, stretching his supply lines. So Napoleon, he's moving his army in, and they're moving along several like parallel avenues. So don't think of this massive 600,000-man army like moving in a big mob. Uh, they're, they're along parallel roads and lines, and they're moving in. But because of the poor road conditions, they end up kind of consolidating into a column headed towards Moscow. And so you can see on the, on the screen here, you have... Um, and this area over here, which Napoleon controls, and then the pink is the is Russia. And so he moves in. You can see his these arrows. They're all going in, and they're headed towards Moscow. But because of the road systems and, and, and how it's not very good, uh, it's muddy and it takes a long time to get through these different uh, tangle of roads, um, they end up kind of going along these parallel paths, and they end up kind of just like consolidating in. And then finally, it's just kind of like this one mass being pushed in towards Moscow. And even though he gets to Moscow, he takes Moscow, actually, but it's because the Russians just continue to backing up. They just continue to, to um, retreat. Uh, that's as far as he gets because then he will be pushed back. So Russia is using a scorched earth retreat. No supplies are from the land. These are Napoleon's Russian problems. Number one, Russian scorched earth retreat, no supplies from the land. Number two, the soldiers were moving much faster than their supply wagons. So an army can only move as fast as its supplies. If it, if it outstretches its supplies, they run out of supplies and they can't get them. But it also kind of leaves a, uh, an opportunity for the enemy to come swinging in and, and cut the supply lines. There's poor road networks in Russia. Uh, the weather was poor. Uh, the Russian winter was just devastating for, for Napoleon. They had to deal with disease and then obviously stragglers. As, as the army is moving, you know, some of these guys are not doing very well because of sickness or winter weather or tiredness or whatever. 
and and they're stragglers. So it's just a lot of problems. They're just really stretched out here in Russia. And I just put a note in there. If you know anything about World War II, uh, this is uh, many of the same issues occurred in regards to Hitler's forces in 1941 when Hitler invaded um, Russia. And in 1941, Hitler basically lost Russia because of these same things, the winter, disease, you know, poor net road networks. So of his grand army, when Russia is pushed back into Europe, only 40,000 returned to France. So a lot of men died going into this Russian campaign. Here's a painting of the retreat. So Napoleon's treat, retreat from Russia. You can see the guys are dead there in the snow. These guys are freezing. They just can't wait to get out of there. 1814, Napoleon, back in Europe, he abdicates the throne. So he, that means he quits, he gives it up. Um, and he's actually sent to the island of Elba in exile. Okay, so he doesn't look so proud anymore sitting there in the chair. Island of Elba is his first exile. And you can see here, I tried to get it on the map the best I could, but here's Italy in this, here's the boot of Italy. Well, Elba is right there off the coast of Italy. So here's a blow up of it. Here's Italy and then here's Elba. This, uh, this island right here. So he's sent there, and he's in exile there, but he's not only there for a short time. So he's on Elba, and 10 months later, Napoleon leaves the island and returns to France, and he begins to gather loyal for forces all along the way. Now, me saying that, it's a very op it's oversimplification of what takes place. It's not like he just decides, I'm going to go back to France now. He had some support. And, and people were saying, we'll join you again. And so Napoleon goes back and he's gathering forces along the way. When Louis XVIII, who is the monarch there in France at this time, he sends an army to stop Napoleon, but many of his army defects and joins Napoleon. And so he sends a note back to Louis XVIII in response, quote, no need to send more troops, I have enough. Meaning it's like you sent your troops to come join me and I don't need any more I've, I've got enough so it's kind of like a slap in the face to Louis the 18th so he, he shows up in Paris and he basically has now taken control of the of the country again without even firing a shot the shot wasn't even fired at him so we now enter the phase called the 100 days and this is the final scene for Napoleon on March 20th 1815 Louis the 18th flees Paris when Napoleon arrives. June of 1815, the European nations join together to defeat Napoleon. So again, he's already made a disaster of Europe his first time as ruler. He's exiled. He comes back. He's taking control again, and the European powers are basically saying, no, we're going to stop him now. So an alliance takes place between Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, and they're going to stop Napoleon. So on June 18th, 1815, is the Battle of Waterloo. And we'll have some slides coming up for that. Very famous battle, the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, Napoleon loses the Battle of Waterloo, and it brings the Napoleonic Wars to an end. And October of 1815, the British send Napoleon to the island of, of St. Helena. This is going to be his permanent residence at Longwood House on St. Helena, uh, which was built there for him. In 1821, Napoleon dies, St. Helena, possibly of stomach cancer. Okay, so the Battle of Waterloo, June 18, 1815, you have the English, which is controlled by Arthur Wellesley, also known as the Duke of Wellington. So that's the famous name, the Duke of Wellington. He becomes the hero of the battle. The Prussians had Gebhardt von Blücher, and the reason I bring these two guys up is because there's a video that I want you to watch, a video link for this week's session uh, in Moodle. And uh, both of those guys are in it, Wellington and Blucher. And they meet Napoleon at Waterloo, which is in Belgium, in Europe. And Napoleon loses over half his army at the battle. So it's a great victory for the English. And it's one of the most studied battles uh, basically in history because of the the command structure and the layout of the land, the movement of military units on this uh, field, this big field. Uh, basically what it was, it was three farms that 
and were next to one another. So it was a big, flat kind of area, and then there was a hill that Wellington had his forces on, and there's different movements and maneuvers that take place. So it's a very uh, kind of organized battle. There, you know, obviously, any kind of battle is going to have um, disorganization in it, but it's kind of a very organized battle with this, and, and a lot of um, military historians have studied this battle uh, for for generations they've been studying this battle so here's a picture of a charge of the heavy cavalry that's the british they're charging coming down the hill the british were kind of up on this hill overlooking the farms and they come charging down so here's uh another painting of the battle of waterloo uh, this is of the british infantry square you kind of see the this is just the one corner of the square where the British would, um, at certain times in battles, if they had to, the trumpeter would blow the trumpet and the soldiers would then move into a square formation and they would be different ranks. So you have like a back rank, a middle rank, and a front rank, the front rank being on their knees. They have bayonets. And so they would make this square of soldiers, like a wall. Their bodies were the walls. And the bayonets would be sticking out there. So there's a lot of... A lot of uh, uh, sharp instruments sticking out and in the center would be the commanding officer and basically what it was they basically made a fort out of the men and that was called the infantry fighting square and this was part of uh, uh, the military tactics for the British during the 19th century uh, became standard for almost all of the Victorian wars because Queen Victoria fought a lot of wars around uh, Europe and different parts of the world also and they would use this infantry square as part of their battle, uh, part of the, the battle uh, strategy. So Napoleon is exiled to St. Helena, his second exile, and he's quite a distance away uh, from the first time. Uh, so here's France, way up here on the globe. And down here is where uh, Elba was, his first exile off of Italy. Well, his second exile, he's way down here. There's an island off, it's basically in the, in the Atlantic, uh, well off of Africa, called St. Helena. This is his house. It's still there today. Okay, and that's where he lived in exile. And that's where he died. He died on St. Helena. And that's going to be it for Napoleon. I'll see you in a second. All right, class, that's it for Napoleon. And in Moodle, I have put a video link for a separate video. It's not very long, but it's a video on the Battle of Waterloo. And they've done a very good job in making that video and I want you to watch that to be able to see some details of what takes place during that battle where Napoleon is defeated. So go ahead and watch that in Moodle. And then in our next lecture, we're going to begin what is called nation building. I'll see you then.